It's good morning to you, Sir Ian. Morning, Julie. Good morning. morning. Um, can I ask you uh, about this aspect of of, lo- of 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 the pandemic and the lockdown? I say compliance with the coronavirus rules has risen sharply since December, and it's now at its highest point since the first lockdown. That's a major survey uh, that's been carried out by University College London. They've been looking at compliance, and not just what people say. It's at the COVID nineteen social study, collecting responses from more than seventy thousand participants throughout the entire pandemic. Uh, but uh, they're saying ninety six percent majority compliance uh, with the rules um, and they're also obviously if you look at things like new google data all these other data where where people's mobile phones are how much people are moving around we know that this lockdown is not as strict as the first lockdown because people are allowed to have social bubbles uh, more people are able to go and work uh, as key workers or the working covid secure workplaces where they can't work from home uh, which i would say is a good thing um more children perhaps at school i would say is a good thing do we need to have a tighter lockdown do we need to have a tightening up of the rules I don't think there needs to be any tightening up. I just think people need to use their common sense and need to understand what the rules are. I think most people do. I was listening to something else earlier on that said, if we keep on focusing on those that we keep saying break the rules, we fail to recognise that the vast, vast, vast majority of the public are actually doing their level best to stick to the rules. Do they make mistakes? Yes, because there are pages and pages of rules about what to do. But are they basically trying to follow the spirit of those rules. I think most people are. Uh, Of course, you're going to get people who, for reasons uh, that they declare, they're opposed to it uh, and therefore deliberately set out to it. But they're a tiny, tiny minority. The truth is the vast majority are doing their level best. And sometimes it's difficult because people have got to earn a living, you know. uh, And uh, also, you know, we complained at the beginning of the first lockdown about how few children at risk ended up in schools. This time round, they're much better at it. And now people are complaining that there are too many children in schools. Honestly, I'm for the balance of at-risk children going and having a place and to and be the children of rather key, than previously. the children of key workers as well. And again, when we look back, well, the government's predictions, yep. we saw from the SAGE minutes that when they were finally uh, produced, the mm. prediction was that something like 20% of children would be at school. And, and also the prediction, of course, we know that the cost of the furlough scheme was hugely, hugely more uh, than the Treasury had predicted because they did not expect so many firms to close down and so many yep. people to be uh, sent home without work uh, because the, the first lockdown was ended up because they scared the living daylights out of everybody. And that was a delicious liberal policy. They kind of went a bit overboard and polling later showed that we were one of the most scared populations in Europe as a result of a lot, a lot of that. But uh, the worry with this is, of course, is that I, I, and I've, I've, I've tweeted about this as well. I, I, in terms of lockdown rules, if death rates go down, we're told that means lockdowns work. If death rates don't go down, they go up or stay the same. That means they would have gone up far more without the lockdown. And if we don't see any change in the direction we want to the extent we want, then it's the people to blame. There seems to be a lot of finger wagging, a very big breakdown of sort of community um, uh, sort of feeling about this, with a lot of people sort of looking for what other people are doing wrong and criticising other people, often very much from the privileged position of being able to work from home on a full salary in their nice house with their kids on their Zoom lessons, rather than actually understanding that an awful lot of people have to be out on the street because they they have key worker jobs, they have to be out there, they have to earn a living, um, and they have no choice but leaving their homes there seems to be a bit of us and them going on oh yes there's always a case of that and of course um, a lot of people who are very happily uh, obeying the rules sitting at home and able uh, therefore to work from home uh, need to remember the people delivering their food uh, all their parcels and presents and things that they've bought and books uh, uh, that's actually people doing that who are going into warehouses uh, who have increased their risk themselves to do that because otherwise they don't have a living and they won't be furloughed. So so I, I think a little bit of uh, a sense to this is important. I think the truth is if we f- focus more now on the vaccine yeah. uh, and less on uh, those they think are not complying, I mean, I think most people are, and of course, there aren't enough police in the country to be able to uh, try and resolve all that. You, you do need goodwill. But the key thing here, if we move on to the right part of the subject, which is vaccine, we have to get this vaccine rolled out. Uh, And uh, I have some concerns about NHS England's plans over this. Uh, There's a talk of 24 hour delivery of vaccine. I think that's a red herring. Uh, I think the truth is that what we need now is many, many more vaccine centers. Uh, And to do that, you need local authorities now running this plan. 
uh, with uh, the care commissioning groups uh, in their areas uh, and in control of the pharmacies. And too much is controlled at the moment, still by NHS England at the centre, yeah. <coughs> unwilling to let that go and yeah. to get the local authority. The local authority should have been already organising this weeks ago well but this, of this is one of the issues I, i've asked matt hancock the health secretary about this numerous times last year you know, are you ready are you prepared i mean a for the second wave they kept predicting and and b for when we get a vaccine ready to go i mean literally we've got the vaccine it's approved mm -hmm. we've got the supplies the next day that vaccine being rolled out en masse. Every single time we've got vaccines and the new supply arrives, we want that given out. I agree with you on the 24-7 thing. I look, I'd be quite happy to have my family, you know, take them to queue up at four in the morning in a car park miles away to get the vaccine if that's what we needed to do. But I mean, but then it's, isn't it eight till eight or eight till six? I mean, come on, it, it, it could be 6 a.m. And, you know, so let's not do middle class well, it, working it could, hours, you know. But the key, the key point here is, you, you wouldn't need necessarily to go to 24 hours. Of no. course, you, you should have that facility if it becomes uh, necessary. But first and foremost is not to focus on 24 hours. The most important thing is to increase the number of vaccine centres in constituencies, in boroughs, uh, so that uh, they're closer to people. Yeah. And as a result of that, uh, many more people can go. Yeah. And if you add to that the control of pharmacies doing what's called the very localised uh, in, um, in inoculations, then you start to massively increase the numbers. Yeah. And that's all critical for the AstraZeneca one, which, of course, is much more deliverable uh, than the Pfizer one. And that's going to be the big volume. So my recommendation is uh, let get local authorities, all of them, to run all of this, find the centres, get them up and running right now, uh, not just, you know, one that's uh, uh, within 10 miles. You know, you could have at least one, two or three centres in most constituencies yeah. that are actually rolling up, plus the pharmacies. If you do that, you won't need 24 hours because you'll have enough during the day so that people don't have to queue for vast distances. Absolutely. I mean, again, it defied belief that the government didn't even bother getting, or an NHS England or PHE didn't even bother getting in touch with pharmacies until the media said, uh, why have you not been in touch with pharmacies? I mean, that blows my mind and is frankly quite terrifying in terms of the rollout. But let's see, let's try and talk, you know, the positives, you know, that that, that is at least rolling out. And we're doing it at a, uh, at, 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 a, at a reasonable pace now, though I know it could be faster. Um, let's talk about the, 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 the latest figures. I mean, the deaths now over 83,000, uh, more reported, uh, uh, deaths of people with a positive COVID test in hospital and elsewhere. Uh, we, we are, we've got 35,000 people in hospital with a positive COVID test, 3,300 in ICU being treated um, who have COVID as well. Um, these numbers are very scary. Now, uh, the government, the NHS, were predicting we'd have a second wave. I mean, let's we call this the third wave. And the second wave was in October. Rather confusing. There was also, of course, Patrick Vallance many, many months ago, back in March last year, pointing out this was now, after the pandemic, would become an endemic seasonal virus. Now, and, the, um, and we were, lots of people saying, including you and me, that this is a virus we're going to have to learn to live with. Now, we've got the vaccine. Crazy for people who are elderly or vulnerable to not be shielding right now and making sure they get that vaccine as soon as possible. I'm as desperate as everyone else is for their elderly relatives to get that vaccine and get a bit safer than they currently are. Um, but in terms of the lockdown policy... Um, we know that the, the COVID recover, recovery group led by Mark Harper, your, your, your Tory colleague, has been saying that we want a date for the point at which if we know that by mid-February, the vulnerable groups that counting for 88 percent of all deaths have been vaccinated. Three weeks after that, March the 8th, at that point, we should start having a relaxation of the lockdown rules. Do you agree with that? And do you think it's going to happen? Well, I certainly think that we need to be planning for how we come out of uh, the lockdown uh, and back to as normal possible life. Uh, as we can. And I think that is really important. It's no good for us to say we get to a date, then we think about it. There should be plans and we should discuss those plans now. Um, and uh, that's what Parliament is there for, for goodness sake. I mean, we need to uh, make sure we debate the ups and downs on this. Um, and, and as I say, coming back to the original point, which is locked to this, um, uh, it's critical. The two things have happened, of course. We've got this new variant, which has changed the, na the, the nature of the game. Um, it has accelerated uh, the infection rate, uh, and that therefore has brought a, a greater level of urgency to some of these uh, areas about the lockdown. But that notwithstanding, um, and balance is right, I'm sure, um, you know, that, that, that this virus will return every year. The question is whether or not uh, we're able to A, build up immunity, and B, have immunity on tap, i.e. Uh, with vaccinations that work. And I think that process will now engage rather like we do with 
flu. Mm. But the key thing here is, I keep coming back to this, number one, the thing that now changes the terms of this for us completely is the arrival of the vaccines and their distribution. Uh, and therefore, the Prime Minister has said to NHS England uh, that he accepts, he, he wants all those vulnerable groups identified basically to have received their jabs, at least one jab, by mid-February. Now, he's right to have set that target. It's for NHS England uh, and their bureaucracy to deliver this. And this is the big thing right now that we need to focus on. They have to literally put rocket boosters under getting new centres and clinicians involved in those, organising at the local lowest level uh, so that some of the oldest people can get to those centres uh, and on a vast scale, on a much bigger scale. And I keep saying to everybody, I wrote about this the other day, this is a war. We should stop thinking of this as a kind of, we're going to get to people. It's a war. We have to plan like they would plan in war. You have to have all the localised elements running these elements and command and control basically targeting and making sure people achieve those objectives. Otherwise, we're going to end up drifting through February, uh, still not having got this. And the longer the lockdown goes on, the worse the economy gets, the more likely the poorest in society will suffer because they will be out of jobs, and the worse, therefore, their conditions, and the more that at-risk children become at risk. So there is a big reason why we now need to get these vaccines rolled out at double quick time with no excuses at all for failure to get them to the most the lowest level and to the most people. Sir Ian, just finally and very briefly, if you would, we're well over time, but you mentioned the most vulnerable children, the Marcus Rashford initiative, which the government was dragged kicking and screaming to hand out these free school meal vouchers over holidays now, of course, during lockdown. We've seen some pictures of some of these bags of food um, worth probably a fiver, not the £15 that should have been spent on them. Um, what do you think the Well, what, do you, what are your thoughts on it and what do you think the solution is? But as brief as you can, please, sir. I don't really know quite what the details are of that. I am aware that these uh, some of these food parcels have looked ridiculous. Um, I think some of that's down to um, the schools were given the uh, choice to be able to prepare or, or organise places and companies to do these food parcels. It's unacceptable, of course, that if you have a set of money and you pay for something and it doesn't arrive, uh, that's unacceptable. So uh, the education department has got to root this out straight away. First of all, it's wrong for those who are meant to receive these parcels. But it's also wrong for the taxpayer who may be paying the money only to find it's not actually being used properly to deliver okay. food to those who most need it. Sir so Douglas Smith, thank you very much indeed for joining us.